until now, you've probably learned a lot about the eyes to be competent eye care professionals in the future. Of course, it is very important knowledge for the qualification, but you also know that the vision is not just about the eyes. It is the collaboration between the eye and the brain, and the knowledge about the eye literally only scratches the surface of a huge iceberg called vision. In fact, many aspects of the eye examination are heavily dependent upon eye-brain collaboration that requires patient's response from recognition of visual stimuli. So beyond the eye health, understanding of vision as a whole is very important part of your education. The fundamental goal of vision science is to find out the mapping rules between these three entities, physical stimuli, physiology, and perception. So we perceive our physical world around us through the two hidden legs of the triangle. First, physical characteristic of stimuli invokes physiological responses, and then these physiological responses give rise to our perception. Studying these two legs is the domain of visual neuroscience, whereas studying the relationship between the physical stimuli and perception is the domain of psychophysics. The study of visual perception has a very long history, and there are several philosophical and practical challenges. Vision is such an important day-to-day -day function, so there is a long philosophical development to explain how we see things. Starting from the ancient Greeks, uh, there were two clearly opposing views about the way we see things. First, the emission theory maintains that visual perception is accomplished by rays of light coming out of the eyes, and these rays of light are caught by visual objects. Greek philosophers like Plato believe that some sort of visual fire comes out of the eye like the Cyclops from the X-Men. On the other hand, philosophers from the other school of thought, such as Aristotle, supported the intromission theory and he believed that vision is achieved by some copy or miniature version of an object called idola entering the eyes. Later, an Egyptian philosopher named Ptolemy held the view that vision goes both ways. Uh, so um, the rays once going out of the eye form a cone with the vertex being within the eye and the base defining the visual field. The rays then conveyed outside information back to the observer's intellect about the distance and orientation of surfaces. Now, this is 21st century, and we think we should know better than those literally ancient people. But in 2002, a team of psychologists conducted a research asking university students about the way we see things, and what they found was very interesting, to say the least. When they are asked whether something goes out of the eyes in the process of seeing, 33%, one-third of the students said yes to the emission theory of vision. Moreover, when they were asked to choose among in, out, or both, 24 to 33% of them chose one of the two emission answers. Among those, 77% of them thought that the eye's output aided vision, and about 60% of them thought it was necessary. So this simple survey showed that regardless of the level of standard education, the misconception about how we see things is still quite prevalent and persistent, and it can be seen as an example evidence to indicate how studying visual perception can be challenging. In fact, there are bigger problems when studying visual perception, and one of the um, famous problems is called a mind-body problem.
Do you know what the Turing test is? Yeah. I know what the Turing test is. It's when a human interacts with a computer. And if the human doesn't know they're interacting with a computer, the test is passed. And what does a pass tell us? That the computer has artificial intelligence. Are you building an AI? Mind-body problem has been a long-standing philosophical question of how what we see, hear, feel, or think are related to the physical reality or processes in our bodies. The way we see this relationship will dictate our dealings with the world. And roughly speaking, dualism sees mind and body as two separate entities, whereas monism sees only one of them as real. So in the previous clip from the movie called Ex Machina, the idea that we can create an intelligence indistinguishable from that of human is based on the monistic view of the world. Depending upon which one of them you see as real, a monist can be an idealist who thinks that only mind is real. So for an idealist, physical world does not exist, and the world around us is a mere creation of mind that is sent from God. An example historical figure from this camp of thought is the Irish philosopher Bishop George Berkeley. On the other hand, a materialist would think that only matter is real. A materialist would think that mind and conscious experience are just byproducts of material processes. The uh, Russian ph uh, physiologist Ivan Pavlov held this position, and this is the view held by many computer and neuroscientists of today. As opposed to a monist, a dualist would think that both mind and matter are real and two separate entities and having different relations. So this idea was first put forward by a French philosopher, René Descartes. Like other scientific ideas, there is no definitely right or wrong answers yet, and the debate between the ideas is still ongoing. Another challenge in studying vision or perception in general is about the uh, veridicality of perception. Veridicality here means the degree to which our perceptual experience accurately represents reality. Our experience with the world is generally stable, and the ability to perceive is taken for granted. However, how much reality do our senses deliver? Do we really see what we think we see? In other words, to what extent our perception faithfully reflects all the physical reality of our surroundings? How do we know whether our perceptual experience is just not a grand illusion? So let's take a look at the next example. So the picture shows a checkerboard with light and dark squares, partly shadowed by a green cylinder on the right corner. Now let's focus on the two squares labeled A and b and compare their brightness you will probably see a as a dark square and b as a light square without a doubt but are they really different in brightness what if i tell you that the two squares have the same brightness or gray levels in fact uh, they are indeed the same so when this image was created uh, those two squares are carefully calibrated in their brightness so that their gray levels match exactly the same. If you still don't believe, then there are a number of ways to show they are indeed the same gray or, or, or have they, um, they have the same gray, uh, same brightness. But uh, one, way, uh, is to, one way to check is to connect those two squares with the same gray strip like this. 
C. Now, do you believe that these two squares are actually the same brightness? I hope you do. I'll do this again. Right, so from this demonstration, um, I think I can argue that at least some of our visual experience are consequences of active creation. So sensory information obtained through our eyes is sometimes quite ambiguous. So, so this ambiguity of sensation is a result by the uh, context or experience we already have. So if our perception is purely driven by the sensory input, then we would have perceived that the squares are the same gray. However, we have two other information. One is our prior knowledge that an object under shadow looks darker. And the other information is coming from the context, which is the irregular pattern of the check or the checkerboard. So these two top-down information override the sensor input. So we perceive the check A darker than the check B. So from this, now you see there's a difference between sensation and perception, even though they are used interchangeably in everyday usage. So sensation is the process of transforming physical stimuli into the neuronal signal. So sensation is basically the sensory data coming from the eye to the brain, and this direction of visual information processing is called bottom-up processing or data-driven processing. On the other hand, perception is an organized act of our brain to interpret these signals for conscious awareness or for action. So in this case, the visual experience is driven by the observer's past experience or prior knowledge, which is called top-down processing or knowledge-driven processing. So the previous illustration with checkerboard is an example of visual illusion that happens when our perception of objects differs from their physical characteristics. Historically, vision scientists have been fascinated by these illusions because they are fun to look at, uh, first of all, but more importantly, they can provide a window. They can look into how we perceive reality. So there are a number of instances when we experience such illusions. First, the illusion occurs when our own experience and knowledge conflict with a sensory information. So this example illusion called a hollow mask illusion illustrates how our perception can be biased by our prior knowledge, ignoring the incoming sensory information. In this illusion, we see the face of the famous comedian Charlie Chaplin slowly rotating outside in first, then inside out, where the inside is concave and the outside, outside the mask is convex. However, our perception of the hollow side appears to be convex, even though it is actually concave. So this hollow mask illusion was created by a British psychologist, Richard Gregory, to show um, his ideas about the perception as inference process and how it is affected by the top-down knowledge. Uh, this bias of seeing faces as convex is so strong, our brain discounts all the competing depth cues such as shading and shadows. We also experience illusion when boundaries between the objects are not very clear. When there exist multiple ambiguous sensory signals competing each other for perceptual processing, our brain likes to choose only one interpretation at a time. Now, take a look at the face inside the mask and see if you see something special in the face. No? Have another look. 
Do you see a face or faces? Do you see a man and a woman kissing each other? Well, once you see two individual faces, then you now, then now your brain will flip between two possible interpretation of the mask, making uh, you perceive two faces or one face in alternation. So this illusion is called a mask of love and made by blurring the image so that the boundary between the two faces are also made blurry to make the interpretation of the image ambiguous. So this kind of illusion, where the viewer entertains two equally possible interchangeable perception, is called bistable perception. So for the people who still struggle to see two faces, here is a bonus image zoomed in on to focus on the faces and removing the distracting masks. In addition, the contour of the male face on the right is highlighted with a pink neon color. Um, if you still don't see two faces, then I can only apologize. Sorry. Another instance of illusion occurs when things are upside down. When things are upside down, then details are lost. So I think you can recognize whose face this is, even when it is upside down, right? But is it really the same face you think you know? See, I told you. It is not the same U.S. president as we have recognized. In fact, the original image was photoshopped so that his mouth and eyes are upside down. However, these details get lost when the image is upside down. Um, by the way, you know, by the time of this uh, recording, at the time of this recording, um, I heard a news that he's got tested positive for coronavirus. I feel sorry for him and wish he is recovered by the time you see this slide. Finally, we experience illusion when our eyes get, get tired from looking at things for a long time. This animated illusion is called a lilac chaser. The way to experience the illusion is the following. So do not move your eyes and fixate your gaze to the small cross in the middle. What's happening here first is that a gap is running around the circle in a clockwise direction. When you stare at the cross about 5 seconds or so, then you'll notice a green dot appears running around in place of the gap. If you stare at the cross a bit longer, then now you will notice that only the green dot is left running around in the gray background with all the pink dots disappear into the background. In fact, this is a special illusion uh, resulting from the multiple visual phenomena. First, there is a motion illusion called phi phenomenon um, where there is actually no real motion. What's actually happening is um, just the dots disappearing and reappearing in a very fast sequence. When they are fast enough, we experience the optical illusion of continuous motion. And secondly, our perception of the green dot is an illusion from the color adaptation because the green dot is never there. It is just an after image uh, emerging after the red sensitive cells in the retina gets tired after the prolonged view of the red dots. Now the uh, complementary green sensitive cells gets relatively sensitive to overtake the gray gap as if a green stimulus had been presented. Well, you will get to learn more about this uh, next trimester in color vision. Finally, the disappearance of the pink dots is explained by what's called Troxler's fading, where static stimulus away from the fixation gets fade away and disappear when we do not move our eyes to refresh the scene.
Finally, more difficult challenge in studying perception is that perception is fundamentally to solve an inverse problem, which boils down to this question. Given the effect, determine the cause. This is called a four problem, which is typically easier than the inverse problem, as there exists single effect per cause. On the other hand, the inverse problem is much more difficult to solve because an effect can map onto many different causes. Like two sides of the same coin, every inverse problem has a corresponding four problem. Many scientific questions are typically four problems to measure the effect given the cause. As a simple example, let's say that you are looking at a stick lying around you like this, and you want to determine the size of the retinal projection of the stick given the viewing distance. So that is the retinal projection. In this case, regardless of the sizes or orientations of the stick, it is not very difficult to calculate the size of the corresponding retinal projection because the answer maps onto a single solution. So here, the retinal projection of the stick is the effect of sensation invoked by the stick, which is the cause. So the stick um, around you is basically the uh, cause. Now, it is the visual system's turn to figure out the size of the stick given the retinal projection, right? So now you're, you need to uh, figure out the cause from the effect, right? So now do you see how difficult the problem becomes when it is turned around? In fact, to solve this problem, you need more information other than just the size of the retinal projection because the retinal projection can map onto infinite possibilities, right? So here, here, there. So a retinal projection can give rise to many different um, solutions for the uh, sticks. So our visual system uh, faces similar inverse problems every day. So that was basically the problem of perception, right? And then our visual system faces similar inverse problems every day, um, trying to reconstruct the world outside based on the incomplete information from sensation, which is one of the reasons why perception is an act of active inference. However, our visual system solves this uh, inverse problem without much trouble. Um, this only troubles the minds of many vision scientists and engineers who struggle to figure out how it does what it does. Mm -hmm.